you need to understand that you're running a business and you got to become a businessman. And you got to find somebody else to take care of the nuts and bolts of putting the roofs on or whatever the, your industry happens to be. And you need to become a businessman and you mm. need to put your attention on whatever that means. If you're already a businessman, you need to ask yourself, how are you stuck? And if you're a true businessman, you know how you're stuck. And then if you're a little bit of both, well, you can ask both those questions. <laughs> but I think it has to start with you. My guest today is Greg Hain with Hain Coaching Group, and he works with roofing contractors in peer groups to give them a way to answer the toughest questions in business. So if you've been thinking that hiring is hard because we have a labor shortage, stay tuned because we're going to talk about that in this episode. Greg, I am so excited to have you back on the show. Brian, thanks. I'm glad to be here. It's been a while since we've had a face-to-face -face conversation. We email each other all the time and developed a relationship over the last couple of years. We've referred each other some business. It's been good. It's been really good. And I, I'm really excited to highlight you today on today's episode. One of the big things I like to do is help our listeners change their mind about something. I want them to go into this thinking, okay, what am I going to learn? What misbelief are you going to break apart for me today? So I'm going to start with my first question. What is it about your industry or about business in general? What myth do you want to break down for our listeners today? Well, this is very easy for me to say, and it will be very hard for them to swallow, but we do not have a labor shortage. Mm. We have a leadership shortage. Ooh, that hurts a little. Elaborate. Explain. My industry is commercial roofing, roofing in general, and my area of expertise has traditionally been commercial roofing. And yeah. one of the things that often happens in my work in training commercial roofing contractor service departments, the people that go out and fix the leaks, is that I will have a contractor say, I can't find service techs. Mm. And I finally got tired of listening to it. <laughs> and so one of them said to me one day, I can't find it. I said, that's not true. It's just not true. They said, well, what do you mean? And I said, if you put an ad, you take your regular ad, whatever it is you're putting in Indeed, and you simply say at the end, starting wage, $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll get people? He said, they'll be lined up outside the door. Oh, so then you can find them. Don't tell me you can't find them. You can find them. Hmm. The problem is not that you can't find them. The problem is you have a perception that you can't afford to pay them what it's going to take to have them leave where they are and come to work for you. And as long as you think the problem is you can't find them, you can't solve the problem. As soon as you start thinking that the problem is something else other than that, then maybe you can start making progress on it. My phone is dinging. I'm sorry. I didn't turn it off. I'll shut it off. So anyway, I think it's important for people to understand that they need to be working on the real problem. The real problem is not that we can't find help. It's a leadership problem. Yeah. I tell people all the time that if you can't find good people, it's probably because you're not attractive to good people which goes into culture, goes into leadership. And there is somebody out there that will take your perceived crummy job for a high enough pay. Yes. And that's why we continue this cycle of, oh, nobody wants to work. I can't afford them. Everybody wants double what they're worth. Well, it's because they don't want to come work for you. Yeah. And if we change that perception, people will start lining up. I did a talk. I have peer groups and maybe we'll get to that, but they sometimes get special content. And I did a presentation for them. And I, I stood in front of this peer group and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you all know what I do. I train contractor service departments. And, and often I've been, I'm doing this for 15 years. And I said, often when people hire me, they get on the phone with me. The boss says, you know, Greg, I've heard you speak at the IRE and everything that you say, I completely agree with. And I've tried to get them to do it. I can't get them to do it. It seems like whatever I say just goes in one ear and out the other. And I said, to, I said to these peer group members, I said, how many of you can relate to that? Let me see a show of hands. They all put their hands up. They all relate. Yeah. Said, okay. And I said, now, then what happens is after I get hired, they discover I have other talents. I used to be an EOS implementer. So I have other types of things. And I, what happens is they bring me in and I, be, I have a develop a deeper relationship with these people and they become my friends. And then we'll go out to dinner 
or we'll go out to lunch. And we won't go out to lunch as customer client. It's two friends. Okay. And, mm-hmm. and inevitably over the 15 years I've been doing this, there's been four or five times where somebody has said to me, Greg, you know what the real value you provide to me is? I've heard this enough that I always know what they're going to say. But I say, no, they say, I have a whole building full of people that tell me exactly what they think I want to hear. You tell Ah. me what you think I need to hear, whether I want to hear it or not. And there's great value in that to me. And so then I said to my peer group members, I said, how much do you show hands? How many of you can relate to that? They all put up their hands. I said, congratulations. Mm -hmm. I think this makes you like virtually other roofing contractor in the country. And what you've just owned up to is at least a significant failure of leadership and at worst symptoms of a toxic work culture. Well, we are not pulling punches today. (laughs) And, and, you know, also in that the value of a peer group, the value of having someone that can relate, being able to go to have a confidential conversation with if we don't have someone on our team. Yeah, I have a number of contractors, very successful contractors where I will be pushing them and I do tend to push. And they they said to me, Greg, you need to re- realize I've never run a $50 million a year company before. Mm. I'm figuring this out as I go along. And I think that's the case with all leaders. They're figuring it out as they go along. And what happens in the peer group is that a lot of times people have already figured out that part of it and can help them. We share best practices, but fundamentally, there's a place that you can go where you have a sounding board. I said had an email that just appeared 10 minutes ago in one of the peer groups. Somebody had an unusual roof situation. He said, hey, have any of you run into this before? You know, he'll get answers. So value in peer groups is not just being able to relate or have those conversations that I can't have with people on my team, but also when times when things get a little tough or we see an unusual situation that might be unusual to one person or company, but others have definitely seen it. So that's fantastic. We share best practices. We work on common problems. We bring in guest presenters. We find resources like you where there's no way some of the people that I have referred to you over the years would ever have found you if it wasn't for the fact that you and I made a connection and you and I made that connection through some roofer. I don't remember where that came from, but but somebody yeah. referred and it comes into me and then I disperse it. And so I become this clearinghouse for talent on the on the consultant level and on the services level. When people join the peer groups, they generally don't leave too much value. That's great. And and I, I can I can vouch for it. I've worked with some of your your clients that are in the peer group. It is the thing that they work their schedule around. Yeah, it is. It is. It is that important to them. And it is that critical to them that they're like, oh, vacation can't do it this week. (laughs) Meeting with my group, which is a testament to what you're creating over there. I want to go back to this idea that we don't have a labor problem. We have a leadership problem. And I'd love to get some thoughts from you, especially for our listeners where, well, how do I fix it? Mm -hmm. Or or maybe even how do I identify Mm -hmm. it? Like, what are some thoughts you have on that? So let's be clear. We do have more people. We have more jobs available than we have people to fill them. Sure. That is a fact. But all that is doing is highlighting the challenges that people have in their companies with flaws in their culture, flaws in their leadership, flaws in their basic recruiting process and so forth and so on. And I think the fundamental problem that I see in most companies is one of mindset. Hmm. They have fixed mindsets, not growth mindsets. Now, if, if I say to my peer groups, I say, do you have a growth mindset? They all put up their hands. Then I start asking them a series of questions. And what we discover is they don't operate as if they have a growth mindset. They operate as if they have a fixed mindset. Hmm. And, In order to change that mindset, probably the first thing they have to do is acknowledge the fact that that's the case. Okay. But the second thing they need to do is they need to start exposing themselves to new ideas. If, and whether it's them or you or me, if every day I get up and I look at the same newsfeed, if I look at, if I read the same newspapers 
or the same magazine articles, if I keep putting the same stuff in my head day after day after day, the results I get on the other side are not going to change. Hmm. So if you really want to change the results you're getting in a significant way, you have to start changing what you're putting in. So literally, that means that if you are a liberal, you need to start listening to conservative stuff. If you're a conservative, you need to start listening to liberal stuff. And you need to do this with an open mind because the reality is nobody has a lock on the truth. And this this is not only about politics, it's about, it's about everything. And so I think that you need to read things that are going to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. I think that you need to, I, and I do think you need to read we've got two books on our reading list written by Tim Ferriss. One is called Tools of Titans, and the other one is called, oh, it escapes me. I didn't know we were going to be having this conversation. But but Tim Ferriss has what has traditionally been the number one rated podcast on, on iTunes. He has, I believe, over 600 million downloads. And these are long form interviews that he does where he interviews top performers. So he might interview Mm. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and people like that for over an hour. And he then took and distilled the key things that these people have done. And he's put them into these two books, Tools of Titans and Tribe of Mentors. So those are the two. So the first is the tools that these people use and tribe of mentors are advice. And you read these books and you get you you get all sorts of new ideas that you can begin to apply in your business. So that's the way you but you need to feed your mind differently than you're feeding it now. I absolutely agree with you. One of the I would say that our clients say one of the most challenging parts about going through our program and implementing our system is the mindset shift that they have to make when it comes to recruiting people that they have control. It's so easy to just throw your arms up in the air and play the victim card and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. All the guys I know are struggling with the same thing. And that's where it creates that that fix, but also scarcity mindset. They're all doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So mindset is so important. I've heard it said that in any business that is still where the owner is still in the business or operating in the business, that the owner is the biggest roadblock in the Always. business's success. Always. The so owner is the biggest pinch point. I have, oh, I haven't counted them lately, but let's say 50 contractors in these various peer groups. Stop turning away work, burning out your team, and working so hard. Learn about the proven process that businesses everywhere are using to save time, save money, and hire all the people they need. We'll train your team to implement and run this process in-house so you can grow as fast as you want. Book a call with our team at corematters.com. I can only think of one or two owners that today are not the pinch point in their organizations. Now, at some point down the road, they will become the pinch point or in some point in the past they have become. And in EOS, we talk about hitting the ceiling. Growth does not go like this. It goes up and then it levels off and then you have to break through and you go up again. And, yeah. But for, with virtually all these organizations, ownership is the far and away the biggest stumbling block, the, the, the owner of the company. Yep. And, and in fairness to many of these guys, When you get to be 55, 58 years old, 62 years old, and you're looking to exit the business, A, you don't have the energy. You just don't have the energy that you did 30 years prior to that. Two, to take the business to the next level, whatever that is, also involves risk. Well, do you really want to take everything that you've built up over the last 20, 30 years and put it in jeopardy in the to move it forward to the next mm-hmm. level. And it's real easy for people to say, you know, I've pushed hard enough. I'm going to kind of go on autopilot now. And whether they do that consciously or unconsciously, what happens is they take their foot off the gas. And what I will tell you is that in our peer groups, when a contractor takes his foot off the gas, it is immediately apparent to me. And they immediately start having different kinds of problems. Yeah. 
I, I've seen it happen. You know, I get pushback a lot of times. Owners don't want to go through our program. They're like, I don't do the recruiting. I don't need to be a part of it. And what I found is pace of the leader is the pace of the pack. And if you believe that you're struggling to recruit because it's a labor shortage or it's a market conditions or everybody's lazy and entitled or whatever you tell yourself, it's that is being pushed down to everybody else in the organization. And if you don't change your mind first, they'll never be able to change their mind. It's like in service. One of my things in service is that my expectation is that if someone calls you on the phone, you make time to return their call. If they send you an email, if you have time to read it, you have time to reply. And everybody nods their head. They all get this, right? But the boss doesn't do that. And what the boss doesn't understand is that if it takes him two days to get back to the service manager to answer a question that the service manager asked, he just gave the service manager permission to take two days to respond to all the clients. Mm. If the owner is not modeling the behavior that he wants, okay, it's not going to happen. That is so true. So let's go back to this leadership thing. What's something people can do to, I mean, we've talked a lot about mindset. We've talked about the pace of the, the, the owner and them being the pitch point. What is something that we can do maybe by in the next few days to really help our team understand or, or identify or overcome this leadership problem, this mindset that no one wants to work and there's no one good out there? The, the first thing that has to happen is that the owner of the company needs to acknowledge that he's the problem. It's not the recruiter, <laughs> but he has to acknowledge that he's the problem. Yeah. He's not putting his attention on this. And as you were, you're starting to ask the question, I was thinking, and it, it something popped into my awareness. A number of people over the years have told me there's three kinds of roofers that are in business. There are people in business that are roofers. There are people in, that are in business as roofers that are businessmen, mm. and there are people that are in business that are businessmen and roofers. They know the technology and they understand the business. So I think the answer to your question is what do they need to do differently is I think that it somewhat depends upon who, who we're talking to. Because if we're talking to the guy that is a roofer and not a businessman, and he and they know who they are. They know sure. they like the roofing stuff. Okay. I've got a guy that he doesn't know how to run a Leicester handgun. He doesn't care. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's a businessman. So which are you? But if you're a roofer, you need to understand that you're running a business and you got to become a businessman. And you got to find somebody else to take care of the nuts and bolts of putting the roofs on and or whatever the, your your industry happens to be. And you need to become a businessman. And you need to put your attention on whatever that means. If you're already a businessman, you need to ask yourself, how are you stuck? And if you're a true businessman, you know how you're stuck. Okay. And then if you're a little bit of both, well, you can ask both those questions. <laughs> and, but I think it has to start with you. Yeah. I think that most of the people that might be listening to this really don't know all the ways they're stuck. And I think that the, the people that are just the roofers, if you will, that are no, they're not the businessmen, don't know how to make that transition. And so what I would suggest, this is not necessarily something they can easily do in the next two or three days, but they need a coach. Yeah. And, and that person doesn't need to know anything about roof. I have a coach. He's a United Methodist minister. And I can guarantee you he doesn't know anything about my business. Okay? Yeah. And he's been a great help to me. And conversely, I coach him. And I don't know anything about running the United Methodist Church, but apparently I've been helpful to him. So coaching is something that every business owner needs. They need a coach. And they, yeah. they need a credentialed coach, not a consultant that says he's a coach. They need an actual coach. Wow. Wow. So much to unpack there. <laughs> I think that most of the time... What I see is there are a lot more roofers out there that aren't businessmen right. than the other way around. And, and by the way, 
substitute roofers for your industry Absolutely. because this is not a roofer no, this thing. Is not a roofer thing. <laughs> this, this is, is not. A, this is a construction. This this isn't even a construction thing. It's not. This, this is an everything thing. It reminds me of Michael Gerber in the EMF, right? You've got the technician, the manager, the entrepreneur, kind of the same three things. And we find a lot of technicians, people that know the job, know how to do the work, all of a sudden wake up one day and go, I got 40 employees. I have no clue what I'm doing. What's the next step? And I love that you gave that next step is get a coach. What's the easiest way for someone to find a coach? Just think industry agnostic. Like if I needed a coach to help me, what's the best way to do it? You would want to Google the International Coaching Federation, coachingfederation.org. So let's understand what a coach is. A good coach never tells you what to do. Mm. He asks questions and the questions are designed to get you to look at whatever the situation is differently. ICF is an accreditation organization and you want an accredited coach, an ACC, a PCC, an MCC. There are different levels. Those people are all well-trained. And if you get a PCC or an MCC, the higher levels, they're going to be really good. They are going to have high ethics. They're going to maintain great confidentiality. Typically, they're going to do a session with you for free to see if you think they're a good fit for them and them for you. It needs to work both ways. I mean, I I used to be a credential coach. I discovered I'm a better consultant than a coach. Okay. Not only is my Methodist pastor a coach, but I have other credential coaches that I go to from time to time. That's great. But that's the place to go. It's a completely different experience. And most business owners don't want to do this. I think it's hard. I mean, I, I find it hard too to look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. Like It's tough to own that sometimes. Well, it's tough to own that, except that it's so much easier when you're the problem because you can do something about that. If X or Y in your company is not performing and you're trying to get them to do it, you do not have control over their behavior. You only have control over your behavior. If you change your behavior, you'll change their behaviors. That's a great point. So I kind of want to be the problem in my business because I can go fix that. You can go fix that. <laughs> I can go fix that. Well, and by the way, if you're in roofing, we're talking to a great coach right now who's got amazing peer groups that can help with this stuff as well. So fair. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. just want to say yeah. just a little plug here for you, Greg. Yeah. You know what? This has been fantastic. I know that you've got an offer for our listeners. If yeah. they want to learn more about you or connect with you, tell me about that. We maintain a reading list for the members of our peer groups. And if you'd like a copy of the reading list, just send me an email. My email is greg at paincoachinggroup.com. And just put in the subject line that please send reading list and I'll see to it that you get it. And we'll have that in the show notes as well. So okay. you'll be able to get his information. Greg, this has been great. I, I mean... So much stuff to already think about. I, I've got a whole half a page of notes here of just some of the things that you said. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I've enjoyed it. And I know there's some people out there that got tremendous value, even though it might have been tough to hear. <laughs> I'm glad you're right. Thank you. 